Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. When I think of those people around the world who are standing up and defending Israel daily, near the top of that list is Arsen Ostrovsky. Whether it's on social media, whether it's in grappling with international law, you'll hear his voice, you'll see his face, and in the next 30 minutes, you'll understand exactly why. Arsen, welcome to Defending Israel. Thank you, David. It's always a real uh, pleasure and honor to, to be with you. Let me step back initially because Americans love to know about the backgrounds of people. How did you get to this stage of your life? And in your case, you were born in a country that no longer exists, the Soviet Union. Tell us a bit about the journey. Uh, that is true. It's a, it's a journey that uh, you, of course, know only only too well and that so many countless, uh, myself, my family included, owe an incredible debt of really of gratitude, uh, David, to you and so many uh, uh, so many Jews in America and around the world that fought for Soviet Jewry, for our freedom, uh, for our ability to, um, to escape uh, to a better life, uh, to be free citizens, to be free Jews once again. Uh, but you're right, you know, I was born in a place called the Ukraine. It's been in the news a little bit. Um, as we all know, in a city called Odessa, Odessa was a thriving, thriving Zionist hub. So many incredible historical figures in, in Jewish life, Zionist life were born there, including uh, Jabotinsky and really so many, um, so many others. Um, but our family fled in 87. My, one of my last formative memories was being forced to go see Lenin's mausoleum in, the, um, in Moscow. And then the next uh, more or less uh, day, so after that, my parents sang, get your bags, we're leaving. Um, and, and, and you were, we, if I remember, seven years old or thereabouts? I was, I was seven years old. And, um, and we, we left, uh, left for Australia. I think it was about as maybe, with the exception of New Zealand, was about as far away as possible at the time from the former Soviet Union. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I still remember, um, you know, the, those formative years in, in Australia. And we went, uh, went to Australia through Austria, uh, which was our first stop, first stop on freedom. Um, and, you know, Austria has had such a, you know, a central and critical uh, part of, of my life ever since, and certainly now on a professional level as well. Um, but that really was our first taste of freedom. And then, you know, I grew up in Australia. I grew, I grew up in Sydney, um, you know, on the, on the beaches of the eastern suburbs where our biggest worry was, uh, you know, which pub do we go to for a drink after work or which football team do we follow? It wasn't matters of, you know, life and death and Hamas and Hezbollah and having, you know, 30 seconds uh, to find and seek uh, seek shelter. So I was grateful for the life we had in Australia. But, you know, I deep down, you know, I'm a, I'm a Zionist. It is the single biggest feature which defines me, who I am, how I feel, how I think, uh, my priorities, my values, uh, my goals, ambitions and purpose in life. Did it? Did it come from within? Did it come from outside? Was it a rabbi, an educator, members of your family? H how did you and so, Zionism marry? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we did marry, um, in, in indeed. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, my family, I think like so many Soviet Jews at the time, uh, knew very well what anti-Semitism was. They knew very well what it was like to be the other to be singled out, to be denied, to be denied opportunities that everyone else was. So when we moved to Australia, uh, you know, I think from their perspective, there was, you know, we know what it's like to be attacked. We know what it is like to feel the brunt of anti-Semitism, of Jew hatred. Um, so, you know, we want you to be like everyone else. So you don't have to, you don't have to feel that again. And even though, you know, my family is enormously proud, um, history and sense of belonging and understanding of what Zionism means. Uh, but, you know, I, I never grew up in a uh, particularly Jewish atmosphere in that sense. We didn't know uh, to speak Hebrew, uh, what the festivals meant. Um, for me, the turning point was in, um, I believe, 2001, 2002. Um, I was at university at the time in, in Australia, uh, just outside of Sydney, and it was Danny Pearl. Danny Pearl was shifted my whole life. Um, until then, I was an assimilated Jew, and his, you know, his jarring last immortal words, my father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, I am Jewish. 
and then he was decapitated and executed live on camera. Um, and that awoke me, that forced me to think, what does Judaism mean to me? What does Zionism mean? Where does Israel fit in? And it started a journey in life to the road to where I am today. So you, you, you left what many people on this planet believe was a promised land, Australia, with its beautiful beaches and its vast spaces and its distance from <laughs> so much of the problems of the world. Uh, and you went to the Jewish promised land. You went alone? You went with family? Uh, I know I, I went alone. Um, you know, at that time, uh, I was practicing as a lawyer for a big uh, corporate law firm in Australia in, uh, in litigation, which seemed like a lifetime away. Um, but I knew, you know, deep down, this is where I belong. This is my where my people are, where my country, where my land is. It's not that I felt, David, that I didn't belong in Australia. It's just it was I knew that there was this inherent belongingness here in Israel for me. Um, and that was, you know, only reaffirmed, quite honestly, every single day since, and notwithstanding all the wars and, um, and of course, uh, the, the most recent one uh, that has, uh, you know, bef befell us. Um, but, you know, you're right, you know, I could have had a, like so many people that make Aliyah continued a uh, comfortable upbringing and life in Australia. And I was actually working in New York at the time when I made Aliyah. But there is this not just physical but emotional drawing to this land, to this people, to this country, to this nation um, that led me here. Um, and I made Ali on my own and now, you know, very, very happily married. This year will be 10 years and we have two two daughters, uh, the first Sabras in the family, which in itself is quite an amazing, uh, you know, feat. Uh, <laughs> we're incredibly, incredibly proud of. So... JBS viewers, if you're not among the roughly 270,000 people who follow Arsen Ostrovsky um, on formerly Twitter, now X, uh, I urge you to do so. And one of the things you'll see in his tweets is this daily love of Israel. Uh, I see no regrets, no looking back at, at Australia, but rather the sense of, of pride and joy and excitement, even in the hard times, Arsen and there were many hard times, your sense of gratitude that you are in Israel and you have an opportunity to stand up for the Jewish state. Am I over-reading your, your thoughts? No, no, not at all, David. You know, even uh, this, uh, this last war, uh, which is I mean, it's still ongoing very much, um, of course, as we can talk about, you know, I did so many interviews, including, you know, with press all over the world, including in Australia, and every single interview more or less ended with an interviewer asking me, don't you wish you were in Bondi? Don't you wish you were in Sydney right now? And to each, and they said it, you know, in the, in the most sincere manner. And to each one of them, I replied in the same way that, you know, I love Sydney. I love Australia. I would love to visit and go back. But no. This is my home. This is my land. These are my people. Just as we rejoice and celebrate together, so do we grieve together and we fight together. And this is our land, our home, and no one will push us out. So that brings us to October 7th and its aftermath, Arson. Again, it's, it's mm -hmm. a big question, and I can't imagine the roller coaster of emotions over more than four months. But today, what is your feeling? about how the world has responded, what role you should be playing, uh, and where Israel stands in relation to where it was on October the 7th? Um, <laughs> that's not an easy question to answer, um, but I can answer perhaps in this way. There's a short answer and a long answer. Uh, my actually just came back from, uh, from the US, uh, where amongst, you know, speaking to so many people, including in Congress too, by the way, one of the most frequently asked questions for me was, what about the day after? You know, what are Israel's plans the, the day after? And my answer to each one of them was, what day after? We are still stuck in the morning of October 7. There is no day after until we bring back every single last one of our hostages of our loved ones and that we dismantle Hamas. There is no day after until we accomplish this total victory. 
Um, but, you know, it's that's the short answer. The, the long answer is, you know, there was an Israel, not just Israel, but a, a Jewish world, I think, pre-October 7, and we have a very different one post-October 7. Um, there is right now, you know, 9 million people, I believe, in Israel that are, you know, one sense or another in a collective sense of trauma in mourning those that are those that have allowed themselves to mourn those that have not allowed themselves because we know that we have to fight we cannot rest we cannot pause um so we keep fighting and we put everything else aside until until that victory is complete but something you know i try and explain to people is that and i try to do that when i'm overseas that you know you this is very much a battle, David, not just between Israel and Hamas, but between good and evil, between those who value democracy and those who reject democracy, those who believe in the rules of law and norms of humanity and those who have no humanity. What we're dealing with is a bloodthirsty, ruthless terrorist enemy that does not abide by any norm or any international law, an enemy that massacred, raped, burnt, mutilated, tortured, abducted, babies, children, women, the elderly, without any mercy. Um, this is not just a battle that Israel is fighting, but Israel is on the front line of this battle. When you speak, Arsen, about the day after, and you rightly mm -hmm. say, how can we, we're in, the, we're in the day, it's usually about the what the political constellation will look like afterwards, who will rule Gaza, what security provisions. But what about, if you will, the day after in terms of achdut, of Jewish unity? October mm -hmm. the 6th suggested that there was deep division in Israel. Judicial reform was uh, sort of the lightning rod. Ju uh, October 7th came along and remarkable sense of coming together. Again, it's too soon. But what do your kishkas tell you uh, about what Israelis have learned? Is there a chance the day after for that continued sense of achdut, of unity? Or do you think that it's going to begin to fray once again uh, as we go forward? No, I think one of the most incredible things is uh, that we have seen, and it is quite sad that it took uh, an event of the enormity and gravity of October 7th, um, but we have seen enormous outpouring of unity, not only within Israel, There is, and there is no, when it comes to the war, when it comes to support of the IDF, when it comes to returning the hostages, when it comes to dismantling Hamas, David, there is no left or right, there is no secular, there is no Haredim, there is no Jew, there is no non-Jew. That is one people, one nation here. We have not seen this kind of unity ever before, but it is not only the unity within Israel, but it is there is now, I think, an incredible unity between Israel and the Jewish people outside of Israel. There is an understanding that we are in this together. There are those who thought, well, maybe if we can separate ourselves from Israel, uh, it will spare us. There are those who have maybe said, well, if we can separate ourselves from um, the Jewish community outside, maybe that will separate us. There is no separation. Is In order for a strong Israel, we need a strong diaspora. In order for a strong diaspora, we need a strong, vibrant, thriving and secure state of Israel as well. Um, the support we have seen in the American jury has just been incredible. Uh, but I also think there's been a an understanding in Israel that at the very least, you know, we, we, ha we have the Iron Dome, David, okay, which is this incredible invention with support of, of Congress, of the US people, of the Jewish community that protects us in so many ways from this barrage of rockets, which we have thousands upon thousands. The Jewish community in the US does not have the luxury of such an Iron Dome, such an umbrella from this uh, evil of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred that we see um, surging to levels we have not seen since the Holocaust itself. Um, so I do believe also on Israel's side, there is that understanding that the Jewish community outside of Israel is also um, suffering, is also feeling the brunt of Hamas's attack and the way that this war is being waged outside of Israel as well. Arsen, since October 7th, you've been both in Israel and speaking out on behalf of Israel and also mm -hmm. traveling. I suspect 
that one of the things that has been most shocking for you, as it has been for me and many others, has been this surge of Jew hatred, of anti-Semitism um, on the streets of Sydney, your Sydney, on the streets of London, on the streets of New York, on many so-called prestigious campuses. Do you have your own thoughts and theories as to why now, why in, in, in such decibel level? What's going on in your judgment? The, you know, we, I believe, are fighting, by we, not just Israeli Jewish people, we're fighting this war, and it's, it's a war on multiple fronts. It's not only our soldiers, our heroic soldiers that are fighting in Gaza, but we have a new front that's opened up on campuses across America, um, on the streets of uh, London, Sydney, New York, Montreal, um, all over the world. Um, this is ugly. This is pervasive. This is things we have not seen since the Shoah. Um, you know, with the violence we're seeing on the streets, this does not happen in a vacuum. This does not happen in a vacuum. It happens because of this pervasive discourse that uh, demonizes, vilifies, delegitimizes the state of Israel as the Jewish state that seeks to use and masquerade behind the cover of anti-Zionism as an excuse to vent their visceral Jew hatred and attacks against Jews. But we're seeing this hatred come from all these different angles. It's coming from the far left, it's coming from the far right, it's coming from radical Islamist uh, groups as well. Um, you know, there was a quote by, um, by the incredible Lord Jonathan Sachs. He spoke in 2016 in the European Parliament about anti-Semitism as a mutating virus. And he said, you know, in the Middle Ages, they came for us because of our religion. In the 19th and 20th century, they came for us because of our race. And today they're coming for us because of our nation state Israel. But throughout time, throughout the generations, the one constant has been the denial of Jews to live as free and equal human beings, which is what we're seeing today. It is a, it is a visceral, unrelenting hatred that's uh, being manifested not only in attacks against Jews, where we're seeing um, neo-Nazism, Holocaust denial and distortion. Just look at what the Brazilian president said uh, recently, uh, comparing Israeli actions uh, to Hitler, to the Nazis. Um, we are seeing um, um, the manifestation of anti-Semitism online, which is becoming a cesspool uh, and unfiltered and unhinged and unvarnished cesspool of uh, sheer unadulterated hatred. Um, we are seeing social media, we're seeing uh, mainstream media, we're seeing the discourse on campuses and Congress and uh, diplomatic halls, and this is contributing to an environment that is toxic, that is dangerous, and that needs to be um, forcefully, unequivocally, and unwaveringly um, combated against. You continue to follow Australia very closely. You have family there, of course, and you go back and forth. Australia traditionally has been a great friend of Israel and the Jewish people. I think of people like John Howard, who was prime minister for many years. Israel did not have a better friend anywhere in the world. Am I wrong in saying that today Austria's governmental position is a little bit more tepid than it was? And if that's the case, what explains it? Um, you are right. You know, I think, um, you know, for so many years, uh, Australia and not even, it's not just Australia, even, you know, Canada, which I think is very comparable. Right. And, and we're seeing Steve, very, Stephen very Harper and John Howard were very similar in outlook. Correct. And by the way, and Stephen Harper is in Israel right now as, as we as we speak, um, you know, and I think the circumstances are uh, very similar. Um, you know, look, in Australia, as in Canada, I believe, you know, we enjoyed a glorious period of by real, sincere, bipartisan support of Israel, as it ought to be, by the way, I believe, um, which was something powerful. And, you know, it, it led to not just incredible uh, relations between our countries, but also the growth um, um, of the Jewish community, local Jewish community as well. Uh, regrettably, we have seen a clawing back from that um, with, with the present government. It, it saddens me. Um, you know, Australia joined Canada and New Zealand, for example, in voting for uh, the ceasefire resolution of the UN. This is the same resolution which made no mention of Hamas or the hostages for that matter. 
Um, we have seen a rise in anti-Semitism in Australia, such that I've never seen before. There was a front page article just the other day saying that Jews are living in fear. I never imagined that. Not one day did I ever feel that when I was growing up in Australia. Uh, but we're seeing that. We're seeing that now. Um, there are many factors of that, uh, political, the demographic, uh, but I think ultimately what we're seeing, and it's not unique to Australia, not unique to Canada. Um, look, at the end of the day, you know, David, I think there is a, we have a lack of leadership globally with a, have a strength of conviction and moral clarity that people like John Howard, people like Stephen Harper, um, that we were blessed to have as leaders, not only for Israel, Australia, Israel, Canada relationship, but really for the West, for people who cherish, who value uh, democracy, rule of law, um, human rights. Um, I believe, you know, we're, we're wavering from that. And that is uh, something terribly sad, and I think only detrimental to the Western liberal order as we know it. Arson, not only are people talking now about that ceasefire that you referenced, but some in Brussels and in Washington and elsewhere have glommed on to the idea that this is the moment to talk about a two-state settlement. What's your view on the prospects for any discussion today in Israel about a two-state settlement? Um, you know, there, there is no discussion on that. Even amongst your, uh, the most, some of the most diehard supporters even of the two-state solution. Right now, it is maybe an aspirational goal, perhaps, but now is not the time. Right now, I think we are fighting to bring back our hostages to dismantle Hamas. But when we look at a possible two-state solution, those that say, well, you know, they, it, it comes off tip of their tongue uh, like a cliche reflexively without even thinking twice. How would that look today? With whom? with Hamas, who just massacred, burned, butchered, tortured, mutilated, abducted our women, children, or with the Palestinian Authority, who only just the other day with the Palestinian Prime Minister spoke at the Munich Security Conference and said that the PA is looking to establish a unity government with Hamas and that the world should finally look beyond October 7, whilst they're still paying hundreds of millions of dollars in pay to slay salaries to terrorists. Are these our partners? Right now, those who might even support even the idea of a two-state solution, it's not even on the horizon at the moment, not only because we are in the middle of a war, in the middle of trying to get our hostages back, but quite simply because there is no one to have a two-state solution even with. If it's not the time to talk about the two-state solution, is it the time to talk about the future of UNRWA? The future of UNRWA? Um, the future of... Uh, <laughs> The less of a future UNRWA has, the more chances we might actually talk about chances of peace. Um, UNRWA, if, as explain you Explain know, to the viewers. You know, in the, in the mid-40s, after the establishment of Israel, there were two refugee agencies created. One UNRWA for the Palestinian people, and then one refugee agency for the whole world. UNRWA has in all these years has not resettled a single Palestinian refugee. It has only perpetuated this conflict. It has um, become a hub of anti-Semitism. The school books are riddled with hatred. Uh, this is even before October 7th. Um, the teachers were glorifying Hitler, Nazism, schools uh, that were um, hiding rockets. Um, and this was even before October 7th. There are people who said, you know, and we're seeing what we're seeing these days of UNRWA. Uh, just the other day, we saw about an uh, UNRWA social worker snatching a body right. and bringing it back to Gaza. All this, you know, the, the shocking, the, the horrible stories of uh, UNRWA staff participating in the Hamas terror attacks in uh in procuring weapons. Uh, you know, there are people that say this is just a few rotten apples. This is not a few rotten apples. Over 1,500 UNRWA employees, UNRWA staff, have been found to have links to Hamas. UNRWA has become, quite simply put, an inseparable arm of Hamas. They are not a partner for peace. They are not a prospect for peace. They are not a hope for peace. They are an impediment to peace. 
Orson, I'm looking at the clock and it's not our friend, at least it's not my friend, because there's a lot more I'd like to discuss. But one final topic. You have not let the law behind. You were a lawyer in Australia with a top firm, but you've also led the International Legal Foundation. You yourself were in The Hague during the, uh, the South African-inspired genocide case. Talk to us about what you're doing on the legal front and make sure our viewers know before you end how they can learn more about the organization and if they wish to support it, how they can do that too. Sure. Thank you, David. You know, I think, as, as I said just a, a few moments ago, we, we, the Jewish people and with the State of Israel, we're fighting for our nation, for our people, and quite literally also for the values of that we treasure so much of uh, liberal democracy, human rights, the rule of law. Uh, we're fighting this on so many different fronts, not only in Gaza, not only um, on campuses and uh, diplomatic arenas and halls of Congress, but we're also fighting it in the legal arena as well. And so much of the legal discourse uh, that we are seeing uh, is so pervasive and it has a real impact um, on the street, has a real impact in the way that it is subverted. We have seen this with International Court of Justice, how the Palestinians have weaponized international law into a tool of lawfare against us, against the Jewish people. Uh, we have seen how they have uh, hijacked international institutions from the UN. Uh, but you know what, David? We are not victimless. We are not powerless. And the law gives us this incredible ability to change the paradigm, to change mindset from passive responsiveness to actually going on the offense to making sure they will understand that there is a price to pay and there will be a price to pay for harming the Jewish people for attacking the state of Israel. So we can use the law, we can harness the legal tools to actually go on the offense. So as the International Legal Forum, you know, we're an Israeli-based NGO, uh, we're a not-for-profit, uh, we have a team here, but we have over 4,000 lawyers, David, around the world, including in the US, including in Europe, including all over the world. Um, that are fighting this battle. We are taking on Hamas in the courtroom. We're standing up for Israel at the United Nations. We're taking on those who seek to boycott the Jewish state, those who are hiding behind the veneer of anti-Zionism. And we're helping our students uh, and the Jewish community stand up to this visceral Jew hatred and anti-Semitism on campus as well. We are not mere victims. Um, we have the law. The law is in our control and we can use that to change the paradigm to stand up for the values that we believe in that we treasure that we support um we need to be not mere bystanders but we need to be outspoken we need to speak up and act out um so you know we, we're proud of our of our team uh, those that wish to support us can go onto our website ilfngo.org uh, or of course can contact me as well uh, but, you know, we, we need all the help we can get. Uh, we cannot win this battle alone, David. We need uh, we need our friends in the Jewish community in America and all those of goodwill who believe in peace, democracy of uh, the rule of law and human rights, uh, values that you yourself, you know, have uh, exemplified over the, the decades uh, of your service to the Jewish community and to the state of Israel as well. Arsene, thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers of JBS, um, you've just been treated to Arsene Ostrovsky, one of the great defenders of the Jewish people, whether it's through lawfare, whether it's through social media, whether it's through conversations like this, you see the strength, the pride, the inspiration that comes from people like Arsene. I want to thank you, JBS viewers, for watching us. This is David Harris defending Israel. Am Yisrael Chai.